Okay, yeah. So good afternoon. For the next 20 minutes or so, I'll basically be highlighting some key limitations when it comes to using material culture as a proxy to infer biological sex and gender, specifically in the funerary arena. Um, basically, uh, basically some points that should be taken under consideration when interpreting funerary data. Now, the concept of identity is one of the principal, the primary interests of archaeologists, specifically, uh, especially those uh, studying funerary contexts, because they're working with the remains of the very people whose identities we're trying to reconstruct. And in the past, uh, traditional methods or more so theoretical assumptions were common practice when it came to discussing various aspects of the identities. However, with the development of gender and feminist theories, uh, the complexity and culturally determined nature of both biological sex and gender has been brought to the fore. And this has sort of urged archaeologists to sort of reconsider and challenge the ways in which they were interpreting and reconstructing identities of the past. However, um, binary heteronormative reductionist interpretational frameworks remain abundant in the archaeological literature, especially the, that considering the funerary context, which have been quoted as being some of the most reliable for discussions regarding gender um, and sex. And today I hope to basically show a bit why that might necessarily not be the case. So before diving into it, I just want to highlight some key aspects about biological sex and gender, since the both, ter both of the terms have been misused interchangeably in the past, uh, basically to distinguish between women and men. But um, biological sex typically delineates uh, biological differences, primarily with regard to the reproductive system, um, typically distinguishing between male and female in a more or less strict binary sense. Um, it's something that's been considered as a scientific truth. Um, however, it's becoming progressively apparent that this is not the case um, and that bo the even biological sex is culturally determined and non-binary. So the segregation of the male and the female body is quite a recent construct in our society. And the binary biological differentiations seen by, perceived by us as strictly antithetical can actually be seen as commonalities with varying degrees of expression, with varying modes of expression. And these modes of expression can uh, vary greatly. Uh, and therefore, there's a wide spectrum between, of intersex between male and female. And this is without even considering chromosomal differentiations resultant of conditions such as uh, Turner syndrome or Klinefelter syndrome. Now, gender, on the other hand, is irrespective of anatomical traits. It's not seen as a set of innate physical characteristics. It's um, performative and it's determined and expressed by the person themselves through socially intelligible actions named gender displaced. Um, and these can either be normative, in which case they affirm and reproduce um, uh, socially constructed gender ideals or deviant. And gender in itself as well has been seen as binary, distinguishing between feminine and masculine, which are the corresponding terms for female and male. However, this gender dimorphism is also a cult uh, culturally constructed with various modes and forms of gender expression um, evidenced throughout different populations. And finally, gender is not fixed, it's not rigid, it's fluid, and it, and it also exists on a spectrum, and it can change throughout the life of an individual. So given this, uh, this, cult this complexity and the culturally determined nature of both biological sex and gender, it becomes evident that identifying either in the archaeological record can be quite tricky, quite difficult, quite problematic, and quite impossible at times especially when trying to do so by relying on material culture in a context such as the funerary. And I say this because the funerary context especially should not be seen as a passive reflection of the identity of the deceased, since uh, it, should, it should not be seen as sort of a mirror passively reflecting the deceased. It should more so be seen as a painting, something that is created actively and as such manipulated and changed in time and also filled with symbols. Now, I'll be discussing this uh, through three different approaches, and the boundaries between these approaches are quite fuzzy. I move between them quite a lot, as you'll see. The first is theories of identity, which I water down with some semiotics. 
The second is theories of performativity. And finally, a more materialistic approach. Now, during burial, a persona of the deceased is created um, deliberately or not. And this can be done through various means, such as the location of the tomb within a cemetery, the tomb elaboration, its typology, the method of disposal of the deceased, their burial position, clothing, grave goods, etc. And all these can be seen as, as constructing a language, as socially intelligible symbols, making a language which is, differs between cultures. And as such, it's illegible for those not inducted to the specific culture. So in archaeology, when we are trying to read funerary data in the sense, we are faced with and restricted by this temporal and cultural gap. Moreover, this persona that's created that we see is not a construct of the, is not a construct of the deceased. It's not a form of self-representation, self-reflection. It's a construct of the living, and as such, is a representation of the perceived by the living identity of the deceased. And this is especially true when thinking of biological sex and gender, because um, what, is, what, is, um, what is reflected through the grave goods, for example, might not necessarily reflect the reality of this, of this individual, especially if the living, the kin, whoever's tending to the burial did not approve, for example, of their gender expression. And finally, even in the case where the deceased may have had some, some kind of say in the organization of their burial by requesting to be entombed with specific objects, it's really not a given that this was taken under consideration by the living. So a way to sort of illustrate this, or more so to problematize, is through this photo here, which is not Iron Age, I apologize. It's early medieval, it's from Finland. And this person was entombed with uh, what is perceived as feminine clothing, as well as a sword. And at the time of the excavation, this was either interpreted as a powerful woman or by those who did not, who refused to accept the mere existence of powerful women. Um, it was, the, the sword was interpreted as evidence for a double burial because there must be a man somewhere in there if there's a sword. This is a, this is a magnificent example of gender bias. However, DNA analysis, ADNA, shows that this individual probably had Klinefelter syndrome, which is a syndrome in which biologically male individuals um, in, the, in, the med, in the modern medical sense have an extra X chromosome. This can either have no effect on their physical appearance or can result in, um, in underdevelopment of the reproductive organs in reduced facial hair and reduced body hair um, and reduced sperm count resulting in infertility as well as enlarged breast tissue. So when looking at this, the researchers publishing the article um, as a language, as a set of symbols, as a sentence that we have to translate, we realize that we're not able to effectively do so, not convincingly, uh, not convincingly enough. And when we ask why, maybe it's worth considering that we're trying to translate the sentence using a dictionary pertaining words only related to gender and sex, because to us, these are heavily gendered objects. But maybe what the sentence is trying to say, what it's trying to display, cannot be said only through words pertaining to sex and gender. Maybe we have to incorporate all the other aspects of the and that were really used at a time period of high conflict in the area. Now, I touch a bit on how the issues surrounding using grave goods to discuss sex and gender. However, I want to take a step back and discuss the performative nature of identities in general, but gender specifically. Now, throughout our life, we assume a number of identities, different identities, and these can be seen as performances, gender as well, as acting a specific way, dressing a specific way, moving a specific way, um, and most importantly, in a specific place where we can do. Um, <laughs> and furthermore, gender expression can also differ depending on the arena in which it's being performed and the means of the expression can also differ. So this means that it's really not a given that the funerary arena is an acceptable one for the performance of gender. It's, it must be argued in evidence. It's very much an open question if both gen either gender or sex are proven to be a valid point access of differentiation in any, in, in any um, domain of inquiry. And another way to, again, problematize this, not really to 
exemplify it is the multiple examples of warrior graves that exist in uh, late Mycenaean or in early Iron Age Greece, but also in Europe in general. So these uh, there have been a lot of graves found with a lot of weapons, and these traditionally were immediately uh, assumed to be male burials, and they they're recycled in the literature as such, but no one really. Uh, really dives into it more because it's what's expected, it's what's accepted. And if you really try to dive into it, you see that even an sociological analysis wasn't even really done. <laughs> um, and then this is where this example comes in, in Lefkandi. Here there's an inhumation of an individual estimated to be female and a cremation of an individual estimated to be male. You see here the photo. So these, uh, the inhumation was accompanied by a lot of impressive jewelry, golden jewelry, pots, as well as a dagger. Um, and this, uh, in the publications and articles surrounding this, the dagger has either been completely removed from the spotlight, not really described or anything because, well, we don't know how to do that. Um, and the jewelry was highlighted, uh, or the dagger was read as evidence for sacrifice of a woman and the horses next to it for the hero, the male, in the cremation, as you do. However, this is where I ask, um, are we sure that gender is what it is, gender is uh, afforded to be performed in this arena? And if it is, is it afforded to be, ex to be performed through these very objects that we think it is? Or is another aspect of the identity being performed through these objects? And in fact, there are many cases of these, of these, uh, of these uh, warrior tombs. For example, at the Isle of Scilly, you have a burial containing both masculine and feminine um, artifacts like sword, uh, sword belt, mirror, brooches, etc. And maybe all these deviant, non-conforming, weird um, graves to us are actually as such because we assume more so than argue that gender is afforded to be performed in the arena and more so that it's being performed by these objects, which can, which can have different connotations in this specific context. And this brings me to a lovely segue to my final point, the, the objects themselves, which can have different connotations depending on the context in which they are placed. For example, flowers can be seen as, um, as romantic when placed in a date, as celebratory when placed in a graduation, as a symbol of mourning when placed in a cemetery, or as data when placed into a lab, um, or even a symbol of, ident of a specific identity, such as poppies here in the UK. Um, and more so, moving on to possession, a specific object can have a very specific meaning because of its relationship with an individual, because of its interaction with a specific individual as a biographical object. And this is aside from the social meaning that it would have had. And, and so it's imperative to discern while examining a grave good, what aspect of the identity of the individual is being, is being expressed through this? Is it the social or is it the personal? And again, to problematize this, I've uh, taken examples from the Iberian Peninsula. So forgive me if I mess anything up, because apparently it's the Iberian Peninsula today here. Um, so here there are a lot of uh, there are quite a few graves containing a lot of weapons, even a female grave containing a large amount of weapons, but also male graves containing objects which would be considered more feminine, such as here, the spindle, the large amount of spindle whorls and pins, etc. And I want to focus on the spindle whorls, which would have definitely had a specific usage, a specific meaning during life, obviously. However, when they're entered into a funerary context, they no longer have this usage, they no longer afford this functionality, and as such, their meaning also uh, definitely changes. They, 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 don't, they don't have the specific functionality or meaning. And as Arnold has uh, greatly pointed out, the sheer number of, of spindle whorls here, as well as, for example, weapon uh, swords, is indicative of the fact that they're not, that these cannot be considered as like a biographical object attached to this individual, because no one can fight with more than one sword at a time, and no one can, can actually weave with a bunch of spindle whorls at a time. It's not functional. And not taking this under consideration can greatly mislead any excavation, any investigation, and lead to the reconstruction of an identity that's really not correct. So I hope within the past um, 20 minutes or so to have highlighted certain aspects regarding grave good and the grave goods in the funerary context that should be taken under consideration. 
um, when, inter when thinking of past identities in general, but gender and sex specifically, showing also how we should go further than basically merely presenting a deviant or non-conforming burial as evidence for the non-binary. Um, uh, because there's a series of questions that have to be asked prior to such a simplistic interpretational, um, uh, interpretational approaches to otherness, but then putting it into just a separate little box labeled different, labeled non-binary. Thank you.